Good morning, First Baptist family. I'm Sarah. And I'm Don. Thank you for joining us in worship this morning. Don, how can people learn about what's going on in First Baptist? Well, that's easy. Discover First is this afternoon at 4 p.m. in Fellowship Hall. Answers to all your questions in one place. Okay, maybe not all your answers, but most of them. If you haven't already registered, just come in the north door at 4 this afternoon, first door on the right, and this class will answer your questions about FBC and membership and how you can consider getting involved. Okay. Well, speaking of learning, if you'd like to learn how to share your faith confidently with those you come into contact with every day, then don't miss our evangelism workshop on September 30th from 8.30 to 11 a.m. in the Fellowship Hall. You can register at fbcbolivar.org slash events. And the men's conference is this Friday and Saturday, September 22nd and 23rd. Dr. Jeff Orge from Gateway Seminary will be speaking and sharing on topics such as tools for combating the cultural issues of today and guidance in times of struggle. Guys, it's not too late to register. Just head over to fbcbolivar.org slash events to get signed up today so you don't miss out on this awesome event. And for the ladies, coming this fall to a home near you, dinner for eight. On November 4th, you are invited to bring a dish and join seven other ladies at a hostess's home to enjoy a meal, fellowship, and sisterhood. If you would be interested in being a hostess home, please let one of the women's ministry ladies know. If you'd like to attend, go to fbcbolivar.org slash events to register today. This month, we are receiving the Missouri Missions Offering. This annual state mission offering supports more than two dozen ministries. These are projects that help transform lives and communities with the gospel. We are just a little shy of our church goal of $5,000. Thank you for so graciously giving. Is this your first time worshiping with us? We invite you to text the word GUEST to 417-282-8322. You can also visit one of the info hubs after the service where we can get to meet you and help get you more connected to First Baptist. Let's worship. Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist. We're glad you're here today. We want to welcome those who are listening on the radio or watching online as well. Uh, Before we get started this morning, we have an announcement from our personnel committee. Morning, church. I feel like I should have came out of the door as well, but... um, (laughs) Uh, No, I am glad to be here on behalf of the personnel committee. We are uh, coming up on finishing up the college pastor search. And so kind of wanted to kind of give you an update of kind of where we've been and where we're going. Uh, Over the past months, we have had multiple applications, uh, multiple video questionnaires, and multiple in-person interviews. Uh, And we have come down to a candidate Um, that I'll give you his name here in a second. Um, But first, I want to thank the committee um, because they put in a lot of hard work and a lot of long hours. Um, So the committee members are Ashley Cavanis, Melody Glasgow, Abby Rhodes, Brandon Weesey, Dwight Hahn, and then our chair is Dustin Van. Next week, we will have an information sheet about our candidate, Michael Green, um, in all services. Michael um, will will be coming in view of a call on October 1st, um, that weekend. And so we are still finalizing all of the details, um, exactly what's gonna happen and when. Um, But we wanted to kind of bring the name before you and that that you'll get more information next week as well in those sheets, um, just so that you knew um, who he is and that you can be praying for this. Um, We are so grateful for your um, prayers and we are so grateful for uh, Michael coming Uh, So, thank you very much.
joy and a privilege it is to have the SBU Chorale here today, leading us in worship under the direction of Dr. Alex Favaza. Thank you for being here. Let's begin by standing together and let's read together aloud Psalm 100, which is the text from the song they just sang. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Wait for it. <laughs> Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful singing. Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting, and his faithfulness to all generations. Let's sing together great things.
with him 28. To God be the glory. Let's bow, and let's bow to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so blessed to be able to come before you today to worship your name, to lift you up, to hear your word proclaimed through both song and through your message from the pastor. Father, we thank you for all of the blessings we have, blessings that we take for granted. We confess that so many times we fail and forget all the ways you bless and provide for a bountiful life for us. Lord, we just ask that you would take these offerings, use them for your glory, to bring honor and glory to your name and your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, good morning, church family. It's good to see everyone, and uh, we continue just to praise God that he continues to bless us with opportunities to see uh, what we know is this ordinance of baptism to where people make their faith and their decision to follow Jesus with their life public to their church family. We saw that last week, and we have it again today. This is my friend Campbell. She's recently trusted Christ, and uh, her mother, Adrian, is going to read her testimony. During the closing meeting, the pastor said, whoever had praises or is thinking about being saved should come up to the front. I wanted to be saved, and I helped him to speak to the back and ask me if I knew the reason for being saved. I said yes, and I prayed and asked Jesus to forgive me of my sin and come into my heart. We prayed, and I was now a daughter of God. I'm glad I was saved so I could get to this moment right now. I know I am a sinner, but now I have Jesus in my heart. All right, Campbell, are those your words? Okay, do you know that you're a sinner? But have you trusted Jesus and God raising him from the dead to save you of your sins? And are you being baptized today to show everyone that you desire to follow Jesus with your life? All right. Campbell, based on your words and you trusting Jesus as your Savior, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in the midst of life. And uh, this is my other friend Sutton, and he's also recently trusted Christ, and Sutton is actually Campbell's big brother, and his dad, Scott, is going to read his testimony. She told me that before you were baptized, you had to ask Jesus into your heart. Later, while I was lying in bed, I started thinking about it. I knew that it was something really important that I needed to do. So I said a prayer and asked Jesus into my heart. I didn't know what would happen, but I felt so relieved. Since then, I have been reading the Bible and praying a lot. I want to be baptized because I want to show other people that I have asked Jesus into my heart. Amen. All right, uh, Sutton, are those your words? Is that your testimony? Yes. Do you know that you are a sinner? But have you trusted Jesus' death on the cross and God raising him from the dead to forgive you of your sins? And are you being baptized today to show everybody that you want to follow Jesus with your life? All right. Well, Sutton, based on your words and your trusting Jesus as your Savior, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. And all of God's people bore testimony by saying, Amen. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son.
Well, as we finish our two-part series um, from the book of Philemon, on For the Sake of the Gospel, would you join me in Philemon? And today we will look at verses 17 through 25. Philemon 17 through 25. And as you turn there, let me take just a moment to say a couple things. First of all, I will just say to Brett and our worship team and everybody that contributes to every Sunday, what a fantastic job they do and how blessed we are every week of the work they do to take us to their, the very throne of God through music and the singing of the gospel. Amen? Amen. But Dr. Favaza and SBU Corral, how specifically blessed we were this morning. I am so thankful. Absolutely. Amen. <laughs> I am so thankful that uh, Dr. Favaza and SBU and, and the Corral are friends of us, and I'm thankful that we're their friends. And because of that, we are blessed like this on a regular occasion. So you guys, please continue to come back as often as your schedule permits. The other thing I would say to you that has nothing to do with that or the message, uh, but just a reminder that next week we will have the privilege on Sunday morning, all three of our worship services, of hearing Dr. Jeff Orge preach God's Word. He is the current president of Gateway Seminary in California, uh, the Southern Baptist Convention, and he will be here in conjunction with the men's conference that we are having on Friday night and Saturday morning, and he's going to be talking about being godly men in a chaotic world and giving tools to help us do that. So men, young and old and everywhere in between, if you have not signed up for that, it is not too late to do so. And I would encourage you to because that will give you another opportunity to gain another tool in your toolbox for living in a way that honors the Lord. With that in mind, let's turn our attention now to God's Word this morning, the book of Philemon, verses 17 through 25. Having gotten to know me over the last year plus, if you've learned how my mind works at all, the next words that are going to come out of my mouth will no, not be any surprise to you whatsoever. I had to fight everything in my being this week to not name this message, Oh, brother, where art thou? <laughs> From the chuckles in the room, I know that many of you recognize that to the 2000 movie uh, uh, in which George Clooney uh, 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 George Clooney played the leading role, which he starred, the movie of the same name. For those of you that have no idea what we're talking about, let me take just a moment and share with you the plot, and I think it will make sense. George Clooney played a guy by the name of Everett who was incarcerated in 1937, the Depression era, in Mississippi. And he was chained to two other guys. Pete and Dalmar. Now, the problem for Everett was he got word that his wife or ex-wife, as the case may be, within the next two weeks was going to remarry, and he had to do everything in his power to stop it. And so he decided to break out because time was of the essence. The problem with that is if you're going to break out and you're chained to two other people, they've got to come with you. And probably saying to them, I need to go stop my wife from uh, getting remarried wouldn't matter to them at all. And so he concocted another story, a fabrication that they would care about. He told them that he had a treasure hidden on his land that within the next two weeks was going to be flooded and become a lake. And if they did not break out, the treasure would be lost forever. But if they helped him and came with him, he would split it three ways. They did care about that. And so they chose to break out and to help him. What happens next in their travels is loosely, and I mean very loosely based on Homer's odyssey. They get into a lot of misadventures and mishaps and mischief. But finally, they come to the point where the gig is up and Everett can no longer hold to the lie that they're after the treasure. In fact, there is no treasure. And so he tells them. And as you can imagine, both were 
disappointed, to put it mildly. But Pete, played by John Turturro throughout the movie, has been shown to have an exceptionally bad temper. And several times he's told someone else, even his kinfolk, I'll kill you. The bigger problem was Pete, actually when he broke out, only had two weeks left in his sentence. So what did Pete do? Well, what you can imagine, Pete began to strangle and choke him and put him in a hold. But the great news is he stopped short and did not kill Everett. And you look at me and you say, what does that have to do with Philemon? <laughs> well, is that all we can hope for in this world? When someone's wronged us? When we've wronged someone else? All we can hope for is... Well, they didn't kill us, so all's good. Let's say it another way. In, in the Word of God, and from a gospel perspective, is that all God has called us to? Just don't kill them. If you don't kill them, you're, you're good. You've, you've honored the Lord. Or biblically speaking, from a gospel perspective, is there something more we're called to? And what is that more? And more so, how could we ever hope to do more than that in a world that is broken amongst people that are broken and hurt each other among whom we are numbered? Well, our passage of Scripture today, I actually want to show you just four words, four concepts that I think when applied, paint a picture of what it is that we're to do and who it is that we're to be in the gospel when we've been harmed and hurt like this. So first of all, look with me at verse 17, and as we do that, I want to present to you the word forgiveness, what I'm calling forgiveness. Just listen to what God's word says here. If then you regard me a partner, accept him as you would me. Finally, in verse 17, we get, if you will, to the crux of all that Paul has been building up to in Philemon's life. It's not that he's been super clear or straightforward up to this point, but whatever it is that he's been saying certainly comes to a culmination. This is the payday and the payoff in the book of Philemon. To say it another way, this is the main point. If then you regard me as a partner, if everything else I've said is true, if it holds any water at all, then welcome him as you would me. We're inclined at this point, right, to ask the question then, what is the main point? If this is it, what point is he making? Well, certainly our knee-jerk reaction is to say forgiveness. He's talking about forgiveness. Before I even say any more about that, I, I would acknowledge that that is absolutely part of it. It is foundational. There is clearly some application to forgiveness in this passage. To say it another way, if forgiveness is not there, if it is not the foundation, we certainly cannot hope to do more. For, so for just a moment, even beyond what we read or what is assumed in this passage, let's say some things that we know to be biblically true about forgiveness. If you know Christ, if you have a right relationship with God, you and I are those that have been forgiven much. A debt that we couldn't pay. An account that we could never square. If anything else can be said about us, us as Christians, what must be said about us is we are forgiven people. But did you know the Bible takes it a step further? Several places in the New Testament seems to indicate, if not outright say, that a mark of a genuine believer, somebody that has experienced the forgiveness of God in Christ, we are called to then pay that forward, imperfectly as it may be, to others that we come in contact with. To say it another way, a mark of a true believer is that we are known not only to be forgiven people, but forgiving people. A couple of places that we see this, we don't have time to look at these, but I'll just give them to you and try to summarize. Jesus is teaching on the Sermon on the Mount on the Lord's Prayer. 
You'll remember Matthew chapter 6, verse 12. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. Often we forget that he actually ends that section in verses 14 and 15 by saying basically that if we don't forgive, God won't forgive us. It is not a prerequisite to salvation, but it certainly seems to be a result of it. So much so that we see something similar in Matthew chapter 18, verse 35. And then the Apostle Paul in two places, Ephesians 4.32 and Colossians 3.13, seems to indicate that we are to forgive each other as God and Christ Jesus has forgiven us. Foundational forgiveness. It lays the foundation, if you will, for all of our relationships and our understanding of who we are in Christ. Perhaps that's why it's so hard for me to confess to you, and yet even harder for me to live with, that me, myself, a person that knows I have been forgiven much, I am an expert. I'm not good at much, but what I am great at is keeping lists in my heart of wrongs that have been committed against me. I am great at that. I am really good at holding grudges. And that frustrates me, because I, knew who, I know who Christ is. And I know how much he's forgiven me. And I know what I've called to. Maybe that's not just my situation. Maybe that's yours as well. Which leads to a larger point. Isn't it fascinating, not in a good way, astounding maybe the better word, that we ourselves, who know that we are the creation of grace, are often those in this world and relationships, those that are least likely to extend that grace to others. And that should not be. So certainly a foundational, a foundational aspect of whatever it is that Paul is calling for in Philemon's life and in Philemon and Onesimus' relationship, forgiveness is there. It is a starting place. But does it stop there? You say, what do you mean by that? Well, so Pete didn't kill Everett. Maybe that's an element of forgiveness. Yet I don't think he was signing up anytime soon to be rechained to him so they could spend every waking moment together. So in other words, is there something more? Is there something bigger in the Christian experience that this points to? And I think there is. You see, I don't think if we look at verse 17 we just see forgiveness, but I actually see if we look at verse 17 in light of verses 18 and 19, the context, something greater is going on. And it's what I've called fellowship. So the second concept I want you to see is fellowship, which certainly is based on forgiveness. Let's read verse 17 again, but this time catch the context in verses 18 and 19. If then you regard me a partner, accept him as you would me. But he is, if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it. Not to mention to you that you owe to me even your own self as well. We cannot deny the aspect of forgiveness. But we also can't seem to deny that something greater is going on. There's application for forgiveness, but it doesn't stop there. Well, what is the greater that we see? Well, let me illustrate it this way. By the way, the first two services haven't liked this very much, so I almost decided to leave it out the third time. But I trust you to appreciate the picture more than your brethren did in the previous two services. <laughs> so be on the edge of your seat. I'm going to leave here in, you know, 45 minutes, an hour, and uh, my family and I are going to decide what we want for lunch. And by then, I'm going to be really hungry because I haven't had anything to eat all day. I don't eat on Sunday mornings, but that's a different sermon altogether. Um, and I'm going, to, I'm going to head to a restaurant or head home, and I'm going to be really hungry. And let's assume for a moment somebody cuts me off in traffic. I can forgive them, but I'm probably not inviting, me, inviting them to the restaurant that I'm eating at and certainly not to my house to eat with me. And even if I did, I'm certainly not going to pay for their meal. You see, the difference between forgiveness and fellowship, y'all didn't like it either. <laughs> Paul is talking here not just about forgiveness, but he's talking about this deep and this robust mutual relationship and relating to one another. 
Now, how do I know that? Well, with what we read in verse 17, we can go back to verse 6. If you regard me as a partner, accept him as you would me. The word partner is the same root that we already saw in verse 6 that's translated there as fellowship. Now, remember, we said fellowship means more than just uh, some type of relationship with one another, but it's this idea of a gospel partnership, this idea of mutually belonging to one another. And so now what Paul is essentially saying is, Philemon, if you consider us to mutually belong to one another, I'm asking you to see and treat Onesimus the same way. Welcome him. It's a word that carries with it the idea of receiving or being willing to associate or acknowledge in your sphere of influence, in your other relationships. I think he's talking about the church. Essentially, he's saying, if you consider me one that's mutually identified with you, Philemon, in Christ, then I'm calling you with Onesimus to include him in the church that meets in your house. This is more than simple forgiveness. This is genuine relationship. This is gospel relationship. Now, what he writes in verses 18 and 19, the foundation in his own life and ministry based upon which he's calling Philemon to this is nothing short of astounding. Just listen to what he writes. But if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge it to my account. I, Paul, I'm writing this with my own hand. I will repay it. Not to mention to you that you owe to me even your own self as well. So the best way to say about, think about this is in bookkeeping terms, accounting terms. What Paul seems to be saying to Philemon is, Philemon, as it relates to relationship with you, think of two ledgers. Take, think of two books. The book that I have before you, or the ledger that I have with you, and the ledger that Onesimus has with you. And here's what he's saying. If there is any deficit... In Onesimus' account, you erase that out of his and you write it in mine. And oh, by the way, if there's any surplus, goodwill, in my ledger with you, you just go right on ahead and you move that over to Onesimus' account. Now, just for a moment, that is profound. That is called skin in the game. But maybe the better question is why in the world would Paul say this? What would make him even think of something so crazy? Well, I know he doesn't say it, but the only right explanation is he did so because in an imperfect way, he is taking up the ministry of Christ amongst other people. He is imitating Christ in this reconciliation of relationships. What did Christ do for us in God? Well, he squared an account of ours that we could never pay to grant to us something that was his that on our own could never be ours. Where do we see this more explicitly? Well, let's just for a moment be reminded of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 20 and 21. This is where he got it from. You don't have to turn there, but if you want to, you can. But just listen. Here's what he writes. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ... As though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Paul took that serious. And what comes next in verse 21 gave him his model or his picture for how this works. Listen to what he writes. He made him, meaning Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sent on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him charging to Jesus' account what we could not pay and giving us from Jesus' account that which we could not earn, his righteousness. And Paul says, I'm imitating Christ and I'm taking up the ministry of reconciliation and I will do it in two brothers' lives as well. That's what he's talking about here. It was one of the church fathers that speaking of these verses said it best like this that I do think sums up the point. He said, it is a sign of haughty pride to refuse to acknowledge as a brother one from among whom God has numbered as his sons. That's what he's talking about here, counting as a brother those who God has numbered as his sons and daughters in Christ. Furthermore, we see a couple things in verse 19 just to make more sense of this. I'm writing this with my own hand. I will pay it. Then he says, not to mention... You owe me your own self as well. 
What's he talking about here? He's implying that he is Philemon's spiritual father, meaning that he is the one that led Philemon to the Lord. Let's remind ourselves for a moment, according to last week, who is it that led Onesimus to the Lord? You got it, Paul. So from Paul's perspective, he's the perfect person to do this. This makes sense. He's not reconciling two strangers. He's reconciling two of his spiritual sons. But again, we can say it even more broadly. He, in the gospel, is reconciling two brothers. Now, what I find fascinating is the other thing that he says in verse 19. It's as if he takes the stylus from the writing secretary and he signs the world's first IOU. Philemon, you know I'm good for it. I've signed my own name. I've put my own letters. You can trust me to pay it. If you trust me, accept him. He's talking about robust Christian fellowship. Not just forgiveness, but fellowship. So is that it for Paul? Does he just stop there? Well, you look and you say, oh me, I wish it was, but pastor's got six more verses. (laughs) Believe it or not, there is more. We don't just see forgiveness and fellowship. But listen, I want you to see verses 20 and 21. We'll try to be a little quicker here with this. Not only do we see forgiveness and fellowship, but we see further. Paul wants him to even go further with his brother. Yes, brother, let me benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ, having confidence in your obedience. I write to you, you since I know that you will do even more than what I say. Paul, strangely enough, says to Philemon, I want a benefit from you. Maybe he didn't say it in those words. You ever wanted a benefit from somebody? Maybe just a friend. You kind of wanted them to, you know, you wanted to obligate. Because your friendship, your relationship, they needed, you needed them to help you do something. Um, maybe it's somebody that you've helped out in the past. I used to have a truck. People would ask me to help them move all the time. I hate that more than anything in the world. That's why I got rid of my truck. I have a Jeep. You can't get as much stuff in the Jeep. But I help somebody move. Hey, it's going to come back around on you in some time. At some point, I'm asking you to help me move something that my wife has bought. Okay? It's just going to happen. I thought y'all would like that one too. But... <laughs> but here's what I find. Here's what I find about the benefits that I want. They're, they're extraordinarily selfish. I, it, 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 it's all based on me and what I want, what I want for me. That's kind of the nature of of requests sometimes, isn't it? Very selfish, very self-centered. So is that what we see here from Paul? Paul's just gone into selfish mode. He's going to ask for a benefit that's extremely selfish to himself. If we continue to read and we know what he's saying here, it's not selfish at all. It's It's an extremely selfless act. Well, how do I know that? Yes, brother, let me benefit from you in the Lord. Can we just be reminded for a moment what Onesimus' name means? It means useful. It means profitable. It means benefit. He's playing on words. In other words, whatever benefit he's calling for, he's asking for it in regards to Onesimus. That continues to play out a little bit more as we see what happens at the second part of verse 20. Refresh my heart in the Lord. Remember, this word heart becomes very important in the book of Philemon as a whole. It's already been used twice before now. It's not the word that refers to the muscle that pumps blood through your body. It's the word that means where the seat of your emotions or your affections are. He used it in verse 7, and then he used it again in verse 12, referring to Onesimus, his son, as his very heart, as his very affection. And remember, Philemon is one to have known maybe a pastor who would often refresh the hearts of the saints. Now Paul asked him to refresh his heart, who is none other than Onesimus himself. The benefit he desires is something related to Onesimus. Onesimus is good. And maybe he clarifies it in verse 21. Having confidence in your obedience, I write to you, since I know that you will do even more than what I say. Volume upon volume, argument upon argument has been had about what is meant by the more than what he says. We kind of wish that Paul would have told us instead of just saying more than what I say. We wish he'd have said it, but he didn't. So some people go, well, he's, 
he's implying Onesimus' freedom, his emancipation. Some say that he's, he's just talking about equal standing in the church and maybe even being able to minister alongside Philemon in the church. Some think that he's actually talking about sending Onesimus back to Paul to help Paul in his ministry. The truth of the matter is we don't know. But we do know this. Whatever it is that he's saying, it is based on the equality of personhood and the equality of brotherhood, regardless of past or differences, that must exist between people in the church when they know the Lord. So even if it wasn't his freedom, what Paul writes here, I truly believe, is the foundation, equality of people that the Bible upholds that does become the foundation for why no Christian should ever biblically justify slavery, but we should all understand it is an evil and godless man-made institution. There's actually some historical data that suggests that Onesimus was actually later freed, and he became the bishop or one of the leaders in the church in Ephesus. But regardless, he is clearly calling, and the application is, no amount of pasts, no amount of past harms or hurts or brokenness, and no amount of man-made distinctives coming from the wrong side of the tracks, having a different ethnicity or culture, or even broken relationships should prevent us from being in right, close, mutual belonging fellowship with other brothers and sisters in Christ for the sake of the gospel. That seems hard, doesn't it? It just goes against everything that's ingrained in our selfishness and how I want revenge and I want people to know how bad I've been hurt. So maybe for just a moment we ask the question, where do we go from here? I think verses 22 through 25 go a long way to at least hint at that answer. So you see, we see forgiveness and fellowship and future, uh, further, but finally we see what I've called future. At the same time, also prepare me a lodging, for I hope that through your prayers I will be given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ, Jesus greets you as do Mark, Aristarchus, Damas, Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit ever so quickly because we're already out of time Paul gives this greeting that on the surface just seems kind of sterile it's it's a normal way he ended his letter grace be with you grace be with your spirit and that might be true but I don't think here it's just lip service for Paul what do I mean Paul knew that if Onesimus and Philemon and that church were going to have the strength to do what he was calling them to, the power did not reside within themselves. They couldn't just white-knuckle it and grin and bear it and figure it out. Human emotions would get in the way. But the good news is they already had something in them, both Onesimus and Philemon and the church, for the glory of God and from God that absolutely could cause this to happen and keep on happening for the proclamation of the gospel. And what is that? Marvelous grace. Infinite grace. Matchless grace. So he reminds them of the power they need, but the power they have to move forward in a way that honors and obeys the Lord. Aren't you just for a moment, and I'm taking time away to say this time that we don't have, but aren't you fascinated that grace and faith, which is the foundation of our justification, is the exact same foundation that Paul seems to be talking about that's also the foundation of our Christian fellowship in faith and grace? It's the same foundation. What we need to be right with God is what our relationship with each other should be based on, and it's already in us. We might ask ourselves the question, what in the world does this have to do with the church? What does this really have to do with the gospel? Who who cares if I can't get along with the person that lives across the road from me or the person that sits across the aisle in the other pew from me? What does it really matter? May we be reminded for just a moment the words of Jesus in John 13, verses 34 and 35 that he left with his disciples. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another. By this, the world will know you are my disciples if you have love for one another. How is it that the world will know we're different and we belong to him? 
Well, at least one way is how we interact with one another. So a better question would be, if we don't have love in how we interact with one another, how can the world ever see the love that's present in our life from God himself? I, I find myself at this moment, genuinely, as far as an application goes, not so much asking what is it that we must do and how is it that we must do it. I find myself asking the question, what if we don't do it? If we don't live like this and apply God's forgiveness and grace and love who in the world will, will, and I don't just mean First Baptist, but I mean the church in general. This absolutely is a gospel church future issue. So with that in mind, I just want to, I want to give you the payoff. I want to give you the bottom line, the spiritual principle, certainly but for today, but really for the entire book. Here it is. Here's what it comes down to. Write it down, underline it, star it. But here's the point. Because of the gospel reality, the gospel's real, the gospel's true, we are called in our gospel relationships to go past reconciliation, or what we might call mere reconciliation, into full restoration from forgiveness into fellowship. So for just a moment, I would say, I could give you a lot of applications. We could talk about what to do when you've done the offending, what to do if you're the offended. I gave you some application on that last week. You can go look. That still holds true. But for just a moment, let's focus in on something else. What does it mean to be the reconciler? And I can even broaden that a little bit more. What should my life look like? What should be true in my life if I claim to know Jesus, if I claim his name? If I really want to look like Jesus, what should be happening in my life? At least two things from what we see here. I should be one that forgives extravagantly. If I want to look like Jesus, I should be one that forgives extravagantly. But the other side of that is I should be one that seeks out, not just that it comes to me and I'm willing to get involved, But for the sake of other brothers and sisters in Christ, I should be willing to seek out the ministry of reconciliation in other people's lives. And just for a moment, I want to go back to 2 Corinthians 5 and catch the context that verses 20 and 21 comes in to where we see the whole picture of how Paul understood what has been done for us in Christ and what we're called to. Just listen, beginning in verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, the new things have come. Now, all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You feel like, you say, okay, but but Paul's backseat driving a little bit here. He's Monday morning quarterbacking. Paul, you don't really know what this is like. You don't have some of the relationships I have. You have to deal with some of the people I have to deal with. You know, when you look at the end of Philemon, you see all these names, and they just seem like a random list of names. Let me point out to you briefly two of them. One is a guy named Mark. The same John Mark that Paul was so upset about that he and Barnabas split ways and refused to go on the second missionary journey together. The Bible doesn't tell us how, but in some shape, form, or fashion, Paul had so reconciled with Mark that now Mark's with him. Paul knew what reconciliation was. There's another name in this list that maybe you missed that doesn't mean as much to you. It's the name Damas. Now, later, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, of this same man, Paul will say these words. Having loved the present world, Damas has departed, has deserted me, and gone to Thessalonica. Paul had experienced brokenness in the past, and it had been reconciled, and Paul would experience brokenness in a relationship in the future. Paul was not backseat driving. I want to end with this today. I was told a story yesterday by... um, Tim Jump. Tim's a member of the church. He and, I, he and I run together quite frequently on Saturday morning. And yesterday while we were running, he just shared this story. Now, I'm going to tell you, I'm probably going to miss some of the details. 
because it was in the middle of a ten and a half mile run. Ten and a half mile run. So you'll you'll forgive me. I was like sucking wind at this point and trying not to die. But it was a fantastic story. He tells this story. He'd been reading a book about all these examples of forgiveness. About how in the boot hill of Missouri, there are these fantastic pine trees. There's these trees that the boot hill is known for. And there was this farm that this kind of old crass farmer owned. And he had all these pine trees on it. And he also had a stubborn bull on this farm. And so he couldn't get it to do what he wanted. So he just ended up chaining this bull to one of these pine trees. And the, the bull would go round and around, and it really began to damage the tree, scar it. And uh, every time it would make a rut in the tree, he would just tighten the train, chain down a little bit more. Well, at some point, the farm changed hands, and a younger couple took it over. And their story was they themselves had had a broken relationship within their marriage. They had some struggles within their marriage. When the farmer sold the farm, he, you know, let the bull off the chain and sn simply just snapped the chain right where it was and left one link connected to the, the, the pine tree itself. Fast forward a few years, there was an, an infestation of locusts that devoured the area and devoured these pine trees, so much so that on this farm, like every pine tree except this one was actually, was actually killed. At the same time, this broken relationship between this husband and wife was actually mended. And the reason why is one of them had had a past broken relationship, a past hurt or scar, that gave them the skills necessary for them to be able to mend this relationship. God taking a hurt in the past and using it for something good for reconciliation in the future. At the same time, Scientists and horticulturalists just wanted to know what is it that's called this one tree to be able to sustain these attacks. So they took samples, they did some research, and what they found out is this tree, amongst all of the other, other, other trees, had a higher content in its makeup of iron than any other tree. And it was supposed that this iron that came from that chain, from all that damage, somehow protected it when the attacks of the locust came. Again, a hurt, a scar in the past, giving it fortitude for what it was going through in the present. Perhaps we want to be used, but we don't like the hurt. Perhaps we think, God, I want to be close to you, but I can't get over what's been done to me. Several, several people have actually been attributed, uh, has, this quote has been attributed to, but the one that I heard it, given to was none other than Charles Spurgeon, who supposedly said, God has never used a man greatly who, who's, who, how, who he has at first harmed deeply. Are we willing to be harmed deeply for the Lord and turn around and not use that as ammunition to hurt others, but to build up the kingdom? Brothers and sisters, will be, we be individuals and a church that takes broken relationships and broken things for the purpose of pointing others to Christ and building the kingdom. May it be so, Lord Jesus. Let's pray together. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I'll be here at the front and others as well. And I just wonder if there's anyone in the room that because of your sin feels so separated and broken from a father that loves you. We would love to talk with you about how to trust Christ and to be forgiven. Wonder if there's someone in the room that has a broken relationship and has past hurts. Would you come today and give that to the Lord? Or I wonder if there's someone today that is just feeling the call, has felt the call to engage other people and to be a reconciler for the sake of the kingdom. We invite you to come. Just lay that on the altar this morning. I'm going to pray. When I say amen, we're going to begin to respond. Gracious Father. Thank you for your love and your mercy. Thank you that you are a reconciling God for us in Christ. And thank you that out of the fruit of that reconciliation, you call us to be forgivers and reconcilers. Help us to be those for your glory and your good to go out and proclaim the gospel with our words and life and build the kingdom for your glory. We will submit it to you, understanding that nothing is lost on you and you can use it all. We thank you, we pray all this, and we give it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Let's stand together as we sing our invitation. The love of God is
questions that you would like to talk to a pastor about, maybe following Jesus or being baptized or joining First Baptist, we would love to connect with you about those things. If you want to text the word connect to the number that might be on the screen, 417-282-8322. Or if you want to talk to us face to face, we'll be around after the service. And if you have not had the chance to meet Adam yet, he will be in the hospitality room back here after the service and would love to meet you. As we go, the corral are going to dismiss us with a benediction.